Um, this is really exciting, uh, as we heard before, the first talk since like forever. So let's see if this works. Yes, it does. Okay, just some words about me. I started coding at the age of 14. Uh, since then, I've been a programmer, team lead, software architect, operator, administrator. I've been in the industry about 20 years, so like earning money with, with software, not just tinkering with it, uh, and 50% of the time working in sim single team scenarios. So I've always been the guy who, you know, set up your developer workstations, set up the servers, right click, e export to war file, copy it over to the server, watch it, monitor it. I've done that for a very, very long time. I think we call it DevOps today. Um, now I'm a product architect uh, at Dynatrace and coming from these really small routes, today I'm working with about 10 teams distributed uh, throughout Vienna, Graz, and Detroit, uh, which is kind of a very exciting journey. Um, just uh, on a side note, I have two kids. I love 8-bit Commodore machines, so like the VC20, C64, the 128. I have a couple of them at home. <laughs> I can build a cluster of them, I guess. I love biking, and I'm 42 years old. You know, 42, the answer to the ultimate question. So this year, I'm always right, I guess. Okay, um, why the title, the, the Grand Slam? So the Grand Slam in tennis means you have to win the four major tennis championships, ideally in one year. Um, these are on three different surfaces. So the US Open and the Australian Open are on hard court, Paris is on clay, Wimbledon is on grass. So to win all of these tournaments, you cannot just be excellent in one, on one surface, you have to master them all. For software development, for me, I think this means you need to be successful over a longer period of time, facing different contexts. Um, I mean, this talk could also be called How to Win the Coding Marathon, but I just decided for, for tennis. So when we look at the rules of it, what are the rules of tennis? You know, there is the baseline, the service line. If you um, if you're serving the ball, you have to um, aim the ball into the service box so that the ball needs to be inside of the service box. Um, and this is basically the rules. Never touch the, the net, and so on, and so on. But when we think about the rules of tennis, how do the rules of tennis help you win a Grand Slam? They don't. Think about Dominic Thiem, you know, our once top three tennis player. So when he lost his last match in the analysis, did you hear someone say, Dominic Thiem lost the match, although he followed the rules so hard. He really followed the rules, but he just didn't make it. So no, <laughs> that's not how you win a game. That's not, not how you win uh, the Grand Slam. It's much more about, you know, be aggressive, uh, tactics, attack. Uh, open the court, things like that. And the same really goes for coding. In coding, it's not about the language. Uh, it's not about the syntax of Java or, or anything like that. So it is about much, much more. Um, and this is the, the reason why the rules for tennis are actually the reason why this is not called uh, the coding marathon, because for the coding marathon, the single rule would just be run and never stop. OK. so. Um, I told you a little bit about my background. I brought some examples from my own experience. Help me understand who you guys are so I can, um, you know, make it a little bit more fit for you in the audience. So is it all developers here? Who is not a developer? Okay, it's just a couple of them. So listen, you might be one at the end of this talk. <laughs> OK, um, in which uh, size of companies do you guys work? So how many of you work in single teams, in single team companies, in small projects? OK. Mm -hmm. um, who would consider to be working in a medium-sized environment? Let's say five to 10 teams, maybe, something like that. OK. And enterprise, so anything beyond, let's put it that way. OK, I think we have a pretty good, I mean, it seems to be a majority, but I think we have a pretty good mix. Who of you is working on a web-related 
on web-related projects. Yeah, that's a huge majority. Any mobile app developers, game developers? Fun stuff, not business stuff? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, and then the languages. Finally, as I said before, the language is not important, but mainly my, my examples are based on around, around Java. So Java, C Sharp, TypeScript, Go. Raise your hands, please. Yeah, okay, will be good. Any PHP developers? Mm. <laughs> Still a couple of them. Yeah, that's nice. I mean, <laughs> yeah, all right. Okay, so how to win? I think one of the first um, rules, don't let your code rot. What does rot and code actually mean? Um, so I was joining this project a couple of years ago, and in the database I found this table. This table was called user account, and these are the properties of the user account table. You know, you have an ID, an external ID, create dates, IDs, statuses, time zones, so everything that you would, that you would add to a user account uh, table. When I joined this project, it was uh, already four or five years in the game, and I'm not going to ask you, I'm just going to tell you. Um, I think what, what they did wrong, or not in a, in a very good way, where did they mix the concerns, was the fields chat enabled, SAML integration enabled, chat trial expiration date, chat team. So after some years, they added chat functionality to their product. And they made this a premium feature. So to know, if this, this user account has the chat feature enabled, um, if they have a trial, if this is about, uh, and, and, and which chat team should, should actually handle the chat. All of these fields have been added to the, to the user account table. And I think this is the first step to, to rotten code, actually. Why? Because this mixes concerns. So we have a sales concept, uh, context, we might have a support context. What you really should do is have dedicated objects depending on the context you're in. You might have a customer object in the sales context and in the support context, but the properties inside need to be different because support wants to know about the tickets or the problems the customer had so far. Sales wants to know the territory, um, any opportunities, uh, who is the sales guy responsible for that customer, and so on. You do not need one single big custom objects containing 30 properties. Um, each context should have their own, their own um, object. So to give you an example why this matters, there is an experiment called the five monkey experiment. You might be familiar with it. So you have five monkeys in a cage. Um, I'm not sure if this experiment really happened, but. <laughs> So five monkeys in a cage. In the middle of the cage, there is a ladder. And on top of the ladder, there are bananas. As soon as the first monkey climbs up the ladder and grabs a banana, all of the monkeys are spilled with cold water, ice cold water. This happens two or three times. And as soon as a monkey climbs up the ladder and wants to, to grab a banana, all the other monkeys basically pull him down, keeping him from, um, from grabbing the bananas. because they don't want to get spilled again. After a couple days, or after some time, one monkey is replaced. The new monkey um, tries to climb up, and, and they stop spilling the monkeys, actually. <laughs> That's the very important thing I forgot, sorry. <laughs> but whenever a monkey climbs up the ladder, the others pull him down. They don't want to get spilled. So they start replacing the monkeys one after the other, and whenever a monkey climbs up, he is pulled down. So all of a sudden, no original monkey is left. But whenever anyone is climbing up that ladder, they pull him down. No, no monkey knows why, but they do it. None of them have ever been spilled. So why am I, why am I telling this, this experiment? Imagine you work on a project for six months, and then you move on to a new project. And then new people join, 
they also work on the project for a couple of months, and then they also move on. So after a certain amount of time, let's say 18 months later, no original contributor in this project is left. So, and when you take this into the context of what I said before about um, the user account object or the customer object, you know, you just keep adding and adding and adding because you are the guy who builds it. You know, oh, that probably shouldn't be in there, but I always know if I need to add more of the same thing, I can always pull it out and refactor it. But you leave the project, you will not hand over the project in a way that you tell, you know, in this class there is these mixed concerns, in this class there is that mixed concerns, you're probably not going to do that, so all your implicit knowledge about the code base is lost. This is why you have to look after your code, not only for, your, for, for yourself to keep it sane, but for everyone else. Right, yeah, I just said that. So, the next thing, how to win the Grand Slam, structure your code well. Um, one uh, concept I like a lot is hexagonal architecture. There is a great blog post, uh, again, Netflix, <laughs> uh, about hexagonal architecture. It's basically about the idea that on the left-hand side, you have incoming traffic, so the transport layer can be HTTP, can be any queue, whatever. Data moves in, is, is being worked on around the central set of entities, and basically goes to a persistence layer or to, to some repository, to some other APIs, and so on. To be honest, I like the traditional free-tiered architecture a little bit more because it basically says the same. You have, I call it inbound layer, a logic layer, and an outbound layer. The inbound layer deals with all the technical stuff of the incoming data. The logic actually does what you guys are probably paid for <laughs> actually doing. And the outbound layer takes, a, takes care about persistence or, or anything like that. And what I have never seen before is, I mean, everybody gets this concept, but I, what, what I have never seen before is this concept written in code in the package structure. Everybody just spreads their classes across the whole code base without any real meaning. So what I tried to do in one of my, my side projects was to really build it that way. So in the package structure, I really have a package called inbound. This has a child um, package called controller. I have one package called logic. I have one package called outbound. So all the classes dealing exactly with these cases uh, are actually classes of these, of these packages. So when we look at the inbound layer, a class at the inbound layer, what we have here is two parameters, a string for the request body and an HTTP servlet request object. So all that happens here is handling HTTP and JSON specifics. This is not business logic, this is really technical data handling. We need to extract the data that we want from that class. Um, then we have a call to actually the, uh, the business logic, the do sign up call. And then we have another very specific HTTP and JSON specific uh, line, which is about building the, the response. So the inbound layer is really just doing this. Then onto the logic layer. Here, this is where all the business logic happens. So we read something from a repository for a start based on a parameter. This is again a call to the next layer. We're, we're coming to that real, um, uh, in a second. And then the rest of the lines is calling business logic, doing one thing after the other, making sure the, the input is correct, check for compliance, create an account, send a welcome email, these things. This is really the business logic. Any business person talking to you builds that service will be talking about these things. And then the outbound layer. This is really about persistence or the database. So in this case, here we open the SQL session. Here we actually execute the statement to, to store the property. Here we do the commit. Here we would do, uh, for example, transaction handling, things like that. Sounds easy, I think. <laughs> um, it's very seldom to see a structure like this really in code. And one more benefit of this is that unit testing becomes much more focused and easier. 
I think all of you already had the discussion once in your life about should we have 100% test coverage or should we not? Um, I can tell, I mean, in my opinion, the answer is aim for 100% in the logic layer, but in my opinion, you don't even need unit tests for the inbound or for the outbound layer at all because they don't care about business logic. And the business logic is really what benefits from unit testing. You might not 100% agree, but just food for thought. And also, there is much less mocking required because the business logic doesn't deal with an HTTP servlet request object. The business logic doesn't deal with a mapper file that contains your SQL files. You do not need to mock these things because the business logic just does not contain these classes and these types of files. Okay, next step uh, on how to win. Make the right decisions. This is easy. <laughs> so, um, this is really a, an arbitrary example that I just made up. Um, but imagine your, your code base consists of several major building blocks, like handling input, processing huge amounts of data, persisting the data, and then querying the data, and again, outputting the data. So these are the five major things. Your company is so large, you have teams dealing with each single gray block, maybe even multiple teams, maybe even labs, maybe even you have child companies um, dealing with such single blocks, right? <clears throat> and then we have the blue lines going through them. These are just, let's say, I don't know what um, concerns that go through, through all of these stages. <clears throat> so. I mean, there is endless ways how to build this. But there is really two main, main possibilities on how to do this. So the first possibility is, so let's start with the input class. Um, I'll deal with input process and persist here. Query and output will just be about the same, so I will skip these. So let's look at the input class, right? How does this look? The input class receives the data, and then it calls the processor with uh, dot process, and the result is pushed into the persistor dot persist the process data. What happens in the processor? The processor checks the data object. Is it green? Then do the green processing. Is it blue? Do the blue processing. Is it orange? Do the orange processing. And then after that, return the process data to the original caller. The same for the persistor. So, and then we hand over the the process data to the persistor. There's an error here. It should be process data, not just data. If the data is green, do the green persisting. If it is blue, do the blue persisting. If it is orange, do the orange persisting. So this is option one on how to implement this. Option two is, in option one, there is no code that describes blue, green, and orange, other than in if statements. We have another option here. Let's introduce, I call it strategies. Let's introduce a blue, a green, and the orange strategy. They all you know, implement the same interface, different implementations. I'm pretty sure the gang of four has a different opinion about what a strategy should be. I just like the term. So on the input layer, we still have the decision. Is data blue? Is it green? Is it orange? Whatever. And then we just call the strategy handle the data. And in the strategy, we have methods that deal with processing, that deal with persisting, and so on, and so on. So this code will not compile as it is probably, but it just should give you food for thought on, on how to, to make the right large decisions. Because how you structure the code on this level, this is really a huge decision. If you have these if statements about group blue, green, and orange scattered all through your code base, you will never be able to, to get this in order again. So what if you add a new strategy, like a red strategy? You have to find all the if statements that are related to this and add another else branch to, to add this. So, but if you, if you introduce that strategy, this means each strategy has all the, the gray boxes basically as, as methods defined. So if you add a new, um, 
um, a new strategy, it becomes easy to see what needs to be implemented so that your full code base is basically covered. Also, if you introduce a new gray box, you add a method definition for the new box to the interface, and all the strategy implementations immediately will, will turn red, and you will see that they need to add this, this method. So this is a, a large decision. Um, right, and the gist of it is you need to be able to identify <laughs> what is important, what are common parts, uh, and make them explicit. So whenever you feel like you're running across the same if statement over and over again, um, you might be in for a for this option here. And there is also small decisions, like the blue processor might be a really, really performance critical component, but on an architectural level, it's a really a small decision. So developers usually tend to, to take care much more about tweaking the algorithms and not so much about tweaking the architectures. Um, so finding the right way, so finding ways to, to model everything in code as explicitly as possible, as classes, at least as methods, but not just as if statements, is, is very important in my opinion. So this all sounds great. Tomorrow you will go back to work. You will want to you know, do all what I said so far, because it's so great. <laughs> but then you turn on your computer, you open your IDE, and the question is, but how do I win the Grand Slam with the code base that's already rotten? Um, Asking for a friend, right? The question about refactoring or rewrite. I also just want to um, share one or two words about this. Um, because it really depends on how long it takes if you should rewrite something. So just a couple months ago, we had the decision to make refactor or rewrite. And the team said, if we fix it, it was a very small component. If we fix it, it takes two sprints. If we, build it, if we rebuild it from scratch, it takes us two sprints. So we definitely rebuild the component. And this is one of the advantages of a good microservice uh, architecture. You might have sm components small enough that you can really afford to rewrite um, parts of it. I, want, I just want to, to refer to a real, real good blog post by Joel Spolsky. Uh, the blog post is called Things You Should Never Do Part 1. Uh, there never was a part two as far as I know. So Joel Spolsky, for those of you who don't know him, is the founder of Stack Overflow, for example, and a lot of other, uh, other great things. So you should really read this blog post because he tells the story about Netscape um, those of, I mean, most of you should remember Netscape Navigator, the browser, right? Yeah, I think so. Um, and do you remember between Netscape Navigator 3 and Netscape Navigator 4, I think there has been a break of about three years. Three years. I mean, three years in software is like nothing, right? <laughs> um, and... Uh, we all know what happened, Internet Explorer 6 and so on. So the reason, uh, the question is why did it take three years for Netscape to go from major version 3 to major version 4? And the reason is they rebuilt the full product from scratch. The reason for doing that was the rendering engine was slow. Um, turned out by rebuilding everything, they really had to build, rebuild everything. Bookmark handling, all of these boring things, just because the rendering engine was slow. It turned out that the rendering engine only took about 3% of the full code base. Uh, they rebuilt the full product because of 3% of the code base. So, and I, I really like one of the last sentences um, in this blog post. Uh, if Netscape actually had some adult supervision with software industry experience, they might not have shot themselves in the foot so badly. So, and this uh, already brings me to my next uh, point, how to win the Grand Slam with adult supervision. So, <laughs> how to get adult supervision. Um, sounds easy. Educate your developers. Educate your team members. Educate. Um, and I had that that thought just recently, uh, I also did a blog post about it, most frameworks do a really great job at hiding complexity. 
but they do a really, really bad job at educating developers. Um, I think most of you are familiar with the Java framework that's between winter and summer, right? So I started working with that framework when it was at version 1.3, which is like a couple of years ago already. By that time, it was XML heavy. Um, it hadn't all the bells and whistles, but it taught me a lot about how to structure code. I, I, I finally grasped the difference between what I just was talking about before, that there is different layers. There's an HTTP layer. There might be a logic layer. There's a persistence layer. The Spring Framework taught, taught me all this. It was great back then. Um, now I said it. But um, today, to be honest, I think it hides more than it already helps educate. So I was talking to a, to a senior colleague of mine uh, about frameworks a couple of years ago, and he said he, he doesn't like it. And I said, man, we are working with this framework for like two years, so our project was built around that, right? How can you not like it? He said, I still don't have a clue what's going on behind the scenes. And I was thinking, and then, okay, yeah, he probably was right. You have no clue what is going on behind the scenes. And this is a problem because especially when it is about wiring the basic structure of your, of your project, you know, making sure which classes should be instantiated first, which come last. Also what we basically saw in the previous talk, these, these layers, these dependencies, no cyclic dependencies. You know, you can just annotate your classes. This is a service, this is a service, this is a service, this is a component. It's really easy to get started fast, but in terms of long-term vision, in terms of do I really know what's going on behind the scenes, this is a very bad thing, uh, in my opinion. So, for me, it's vital to think about the libraries and the frameworks you use. And not just thinking about what do they do for me, but also how easy is it to understand what they do. So to stick with the example of Spring framework, I think Spring is a great framework if you have seniority in your teams who actually know how Spring works and what it does, and it's not impossible to know that. Um, if you have the people, because for, for these people, the framework really does what it should do. It does something that you could do yourself, but you just don't need to because the framework is doing it for you. If junior developers or not so senior developers, you know, jump into the framework hype, micronauts, quarkos, and however they are called, they just use these frameworks. Hey, this is slow. I can just add a cache annotation to the method. It becomes fast. That's, that's cool. Uh, that cache annotation might work fine on your machine, but for the, the poor guy who has to operate and run that service, it might mean um, additional deployment efforts, additional testing efforts, um, numerous side effects, whatever. So a good framework is like um, the little prince uh, said it. You know, perfection is when you just cannot take away anything anymore and not when you cannot add anything anymore. And I really think that in software development, it is, it is just about the same. So, easy, what makes a senior? Um, you know, when you're on the same team for three years with people changing jobs and roles, you might be the most senior person in that team after three years. Truth is, you're just the one most familiar with the domain. You're not necessarily a senior software engineer. Um, so it's very important to, to see the difference between seniority and familiarity. Being on the same project for three years just means you're familiar with it. You're not necessarily a senior. Um, I think it's important to change between team stack languages over a period of a couple of years to you have to start over from scratch, over and over again, a couple times, to finally have enough context to make decisions um, you might never had to, to, to make before, but you can just base on your experience, right? For companies, it means please create a culture that allows people to switch roles, right? Embrace the change. But, 
of course, remember the five monkeys. If you rotate on your job, make sure you leave a code base uh, that is great enough to not rot with your leaving. All right, so that's pretty much most of what I have prepared for today. So how to win the coding Grand Slam? Summarized, structure your code, take care about bounded contexts. If you're adding properties to a class, think if this is really belonging to the same domain or if it wouldn't be better to introduce a new object for that. Keep your architecture clean, make clear layers, inbound, logic, outbound. Focus on testing on the, on the, on the logic layer um, and not so much on the others. Makes it easy, actually. Make the, the right large-scale decisions if you, <clears throat> if you find yourself stumbling across the same if statements over and over again or the same code constructs over and over again. Think if this might be a concept that you're constantly talking about but you're not finding a single class in your whole code base that actually has that name, right? So I was joining a, a licensing project, a license management project a couple of years ago, and everybody was always talking about the different products they had. But in the licensing system, there was not a single class that had the name of one of the products. It was all just ifs and elses and whatever else. Yeah, rewriting from scratch usually does not solve the problem. And if you're a senior, if you consider yourself a senior, um, think about what made you that senior and help others grow into the senior role. So I experienced this in my job as well. We have young people, great engineers, they're great. They're on the job for two years now. Hey, I wanna become a senior. Okay, uh, which project have you been working on? Yeah, this one project. You're very familiar, you can probably onboard new people to this project in a seniorish role, but you're not a senior in the sense that you can make the decisions, discover the problems, and so on. So, but we can always help people grow into these roles. And if you're not a senior yet, aim for it. <laughs> um, yeah, with, with words about education, I want to close. Um, this talk, basically. So I think Clean Code is a book that everyone knows. Um, it's really good because it, it, it has a lot of good guidance. Uh, take it with a grain of salt, just like everything, even this, this talk here. Uh, a book I also like a lot, especially because of the same gardening uh, metaphor that we heard in the previous talk, is Growing Object-Oriented Software Guided by, by, by Tests. This was the first time I heard about look at software as growing plants and not so much as creating buildings, right? A building is something you can always just uh, crush and rebuild. It just takes time. Um, gardening plants is much more organic. It feels much better. And also uh, another book, uh, Domain Driven Design by Eric Evans. Take this with a lot of salt. Um, Eric Evans himself said, the chapter on bounded context should really have been chapter three or four already. It's like chapter 11 or 12. Most people don't even read up until that chapter because after chapter seven, they say, hey, this is also great. Let's, let's get right into it. Let's do it. And of course, also um, have a look at uh, uh, evolutionary architecture by Pat. I, haven't, uh, I don't have it on my slides here, but it's also a very, very good book. Yeah, so that's it so far. Um, as I said, I'm with Dynatrace. Also, we're sponsoring this, con um, this conference and we're hiring. So if you're in for a challenge, go ahead. Thanks for listening.